guys, welcome to a different kind of version of Platitude. Today we are going to go through a PowerPoint together. And I'm going to expand on some of the points and make them more clear for you. Um, and possibly even remind you of some things that you didn't catch while reading or whatever. Alright, so um, we're going to start with sectionalism. And I've talked about sectionalism before, but not in really great detail. Um, so I want to make sure that we really break it down for you so that you understand the different points. Okay, we're going to start with the roots of sectionalism. Now we'll go back to the development of the Constitution. Remember, one of the compromises of the Constitution was the Three-Fifths Compromise. And the Three-Fifths Compromise seemed unfair to Northerners because they felt that um, wealthy white uh, slave owners received greater representation because, they, I mean, let's say all of these slaves, their slaves um, represented votes, even if it was only, you know, three-fifths of them, like let's say you had a hundred, and I'm not going to do that math, whatever, you can do the math, but you know what I'm saying, um, that's terrible, I should be able to do it off the top of my head, but I can't, anyway, but instead of his, the master's or the slave owner's one vote counting as one person, his vote actually counts multiple times because of the slaves that he owns. Um, so the North really didn't appreciate that, and they've been kind of bitter about it since 1788, and we're now in the 1830s, 1840s, so um, it's, been, it's been a seed of resentment. Um, Bank of, the Bank of the United States, both the first and second, very much more beneficial for Northerners for the development of industry, for um, strengthening banking and loans and currency, which is great for commerce, not so great for um, trade, which the South is dependent upon. Uh, there's the American system in 1816. We talked about the American system, and the American system um, there was all these, remember, um, tariffs, which are just great for industry, and internal improvements with roads and canals and steamboats and, and railroads, and it was awesome for everyone except the South. And then, of course, we have the Missouri Compromise, which literally drew a line through the middle of the country, creating sections written into law. We have actual sections. North, non-slave. South, slave. Craziness, right? Okay, so before we go any further, you have to look at the distinct differences between the regions. You've got the South, um, and they are agricultural. They are built around a plantation system. They have, um, they are dependent upon trade, especially with foreign markets, and their cheap form of labor, labor is slaves. Um, the North, they're growing, they are progressing, they are becoming more and more industrialized. It doesn't mean that they don't have rural areas. It doesn't mean that they don't have agricultural areas, but they have a far more diversified economy than the South does. At this point, there is no middle. It's just North and South. Um, they're all about commerce in the North, and they have a cheap labor source as well, uh, which the South will point to. And those are immigrants, and these immigrants are going to be um, pointed to by Southerners as wage slaves. Um, that they're as, that it, if slavery is bad in the South, then these wage slaves are just as bad in the North. Um, I would disagree personally, only because um, a wage slave is just a name. There isn't any true ownership in that. Um, there's no real you know, forcing someone to stay in a job, um, and beating them if they don't do their job, or, you know, um, tracking them down if they choose to leave the job. Yeah, um, there's entire industries, there's an entire industry built around tracking and retrieving runaway slaves. People made a lot of money on that, so, they didn't, there was no such thing for immigrants, so, hmm, I don't know. All right, so let's look at the big four issues. We have tariffs, okay? Tariffs are a big issue. Um, it's helpful to growing industry in the North. It's harmful to Southern trade, however. 
because tariffs, you know, I've talked about this a, a few times, but just to be clear, without tariffs, industry is not protected in the North. And so people buy foreign goods because they're cheaper and usually better made. Um, but with tariffs, it makes the foreign goods more expensive, thereby allowing um, American industries to actually sell their products and compete. Um, but it is harmful to Southern trade because it usually leads to reciprocal tariffs. Um, it also usually um, leads to other countries finding goods elsewhere. And South, the South really needs the trade from the foreign goods. Also, tariffs are not helpful to the South. And the South, you know, they've got this, like, this siege mentality, this, this idea that everyone's out to get them and try and destroy their way of life. Um, anyway, representation, I talked about this with the whole three-fifths compromise. There was a very, very delicate balance. The North controlled the Senate, the South controlled the House, and we could not upset that balance. Then, of course, we have states' rights. People will claim that the Civil War was fought because of states' rights, because the South feared this Northern dominance, and that the, the South feared that the North was going to change their way of life. Um... And it eventually will lead to and culminate, it will lead to the nullification crisis. So let's watch a little, little quick little video about the nullification crisis. All right. Hopefully the sound will come through. Maybe it's buffering. Sorry. It's taking a long time. We might all have to sit through an ad. We might have to, you know, experiment with editing skills for this one. But if not, enjoy my fantastic commentary. I know it's great. In the last episode of History Sci-Fi Theater, the law had come to love tariffs because they made people buy more American manufactured goods, while the South hated tariffs because they hurt trade with Europe. And now, this week's episode. In the dark recesses of his underground laboratory, Dr. Regional Division transmogrifies North-South tensions into the Tariff of Abominations. Yes, <laughs> Southerners fear the tariff. Don't for your love. It'll ruin our economy. While Northerners don't mind it at all. It's kind of cute, really. What a sweet. Andrew Jackson's vice president, John C. Calhoun of South Carolina, says the South has the right to secede or withdraw from the Union. Yeah, that thing goes a week up. But President Jackson isn't having it. You'll stay in the Union, whether you like it or not. Well, not. Will, too. Then lock up that monster. By 1832, there were newer, even bigger tariffs, and the country was on the brink of civil war. When Jackson and Calhoun brought in respected statesman Henry Clay, who had previously developed the Missouri Compromise of 1820 to tame the beast. I'll save the day. Unity is more important than tariffs. And so a compromise was reached. Northerners accepted lower tariffs, and Southerners remained in the Union. Henry Clay had once again defeated the evil Dr. Regional Division. Or had he? <laughs> Okay, now I have to figure out how I get back to that. Ah! Okay. So, here we are. So that's, that's one of those things that people talk about with states' rights. But, um, again, I think I've said this before, the biggest thing for me is probably slavery. That is probably going to be, um, the biggest issue. Because Northerners, while some of them really did believe in abolitionism, for the most part, all of them didn't want it to expand. They didn't want it to expand because of various reasons. Um, it's hard to compete with slave labor. It's, you know, um, problematic. Um, but in the South, it's built into all aspects of Southern life. It is a part of of who they are. It's a part of their identity. It's how they see themselves. 
Okay, so um, from there, let's talk about the new form of feudalism, the antebellum society. Sorry, the dog keeps going in and out of the door and it's making it very hot in here. Okay. So, characteristics of the antebellum South. It is primarily agrarian. I know I keep saying this, but the fact that the South was agrarian is a key factor in pretty much all causes of sectionalism and eventual war. Because of this, the real powerhouse of the South shifted from Virginia to South Carolina when it became clear that raw cotton was to be the state's um, and the region's essential uh, product. It became a cash crop, right? And cotton is king! So, um, yes, people actually yelled that. It's the weirdest thing. But because of this, there was this short-sighted idea that industrialization wasn't necessary or um, or wasn't as important as protecting the cotton industry. And so many things will occur. Atrocities will occur to maintain this way of life around cotton. Um, banks were not as big because most were, most, even the wealthiest in the South, were cash poor. All of their wealth was tied up in property, especially slaves. Slaves were a form of, they were a representation of, of wealth. And so if you had them, even if you only had a couple, then you were doing well. Um, there was also, um, Oh, and because of the plantation system, um, the transportation system was really inadequate um, because what was happening is they created this almost broken system of railroads. There were no real roads to speak of, you know, just paths. And the railroads were crazy because they were privately owned and operated. And what was happening is these privately owned railroads, they would build it just to where they needed it from point A to point B, whatever that was for them. And they would build it with whatever gauge they wanted. Nothing was standardized. Nothing was connected. And so there was no real way to move from one end of the south to the other. There was no connection there. Um, and that's because... Um, you know, plantations kind of prevented that. Okay. So let's talk about Southern society. Um, the Old South, in imagination, in myth, right, was a land of prosperity built on, built with pretty white homes on the hill, these plantation houses, the master's houses, and happy slaves and people drinking mint juleps with big hats. I always think of the Kentucky Derby when I think of the myth of the Old South. Um, and all of these people are, are well educated and cultured and, and they're running a stable economy based on cotton. Yeah, that's a lie. That is a lie. That is a myth. So in reality, the South was, was, um, dangerous. It was a dangerous place to live. They, they, it was cutthroat and brutal, and it was highly unstable because guess what? Agriculture in general is unstable. And so if you build your entire way of life, way of life around agricultural means, there's going to be instability. But let's talk about the society itself, right? So at the very top, you're going to have your hierarchy is this. You have your slave owners, your slaveocracy. They're at the top. They're, these are these large plantation owners. And um, that's only about 1% of the population. Um, and then you have, you have slave owners that are only, they only have one to five. They have fewer than 10 slaves. They're technically part of plantation owners. They're technically part of the slaveocracy, which will expand the percentage of the slaveocracy to about 10%. And so 10% of the, um, yeah, 10% of, of the population will hold about 75% uh, of the wealth in the South, with really that top 1% owning most of that. 
Um, okay, guys, so let's talk about the plain folk. The plain folk are going to be um, these yeoman farmers, these white yeoman farmers. They are non-slaveholders. There's no real middle class in the southern society. Um, and the crazy thing about them is that they're the ones that are going to hang on so tenaciously to slavery because if you look at the hierarchy on that slide, the plain folk are the ones that are not actually um doing so well like slaves are kept there because they're forced to stay there plain folk are pretty much the bottom of the the hierarchy and if slaves aren't there that really does make them the bottom and so nobody is below them plus because slaves are seen as as a form of wealth owning slaves was the new american dream can you believe that i know it's so crazy for modern standards but in the south the um, ha being a slave owner, having slaves, meant that you had made it in the world. So the plain folk, once if slavery goes away, they don't have anything to shoot for, right? Plus, that means that technically now they're equal with slaves, and they can't handle that. Um, do notice there is a small percentage of freemen in the South. Of the, we're talking about African American freemen. Um, they were freed uh, usually during the revolution. They, <laughs> here's the problem. They could be captured as runaway slaves and then sold, and it became a trafficking. So if you were a freeman, you did not stay in the south. You left. And a lot of them did. A lot of them headed out west, um, or Canada. Uh, but for the most part, they headed out west. The, they headed out to make their way out there. Um, and slaves were a huge portion of the population. Um, yeah, so, like, the plain folk and the slaveocracy together was about 6 million. The freemen, there were about 250,000. Um, so there were 3 million slaves in the South at the, by Okay, so remember I talked about how slaves are really tied up in every aspect. So we talked about society and we talked about the impact of slaves on the social hierarchy. And now I want to talk about the um, economy and how they're tied, how slaves are tied into, and slavery itself is tied into um, the antebellum economy. And an antebellum, just to be clear, I don't think I've talked about it, what it means. It means pre-war. And when you're talking about antebellum, in American society, or in America, we're talking about pre-Civil War. Um, that's a real antebellum period for us. Okay, so let's talk about the attempts. Uh, Graniteville Textile Company, founded in 1845, it was the South's first attempt at industrialization in Virginia. But remember, where's the powerhouse? The powerhouse is no, no longer in Virginia. It's in the it's in the deep South. It's in South Carolina. And remember, industry is not really super important, but it, they are attempting. They weren't very good at it, but they attempted. Um, I don't think it actually survived if I, for very long, if I remember correctly. Um, so this would be, this is a picture of a large, a large plantation, a very wealthy person. Look how many slaves there are. You've got slaves who are working in the field and slaves who are, um, they have different jobs and you have the steamboat off in the distance there and, and you have the, the workhouse over here. Um, and then you've got the slave owner right here. Check him out with, uh, like he's courting, taking his wife out for a walk, whatever. And they're like admiring their handiwork. Oh, yay. So I think this picture really, like, it looks happy, kind of. When you look at it, it's it's weird to me. Um, because that's not really, that's not, that's not the reality right there. Like, it may have been the reality for, like, ten slaves. Maybe. I don't know. I mean, I don't know the actual numbers, but it's, it predominantly was not the reality. All right, and part of that has to do with the changes in cotton production, you know, thanks Eli Whitney. <laughs> so this is what it was in 1820. And 40 years later, by the big, by the onset of this, the, right, the, the eve of the Civil War, look at cotton production. And it's, it's pretty large. It's big, right? 
Um, look at the value of cotton exports as percentage of all U.S. exports, how it grows, 7.1% uh, in 1800 to almost 60% of the nation's exports. So remember, going back to that whole idea of sectionalism and that, that idea of, of tariffs and, and um, strong banking regulations, it really is um, detrimental to trade in the U.S. Okay, then we have King Cotton. And remember, I yelled, Cotton is king! Um, but it, it was a thing, and it will give the South a false sense of accomplishment, hope, um, superiority, especially economically. They're like, we're doing so much better than the North. And technically, if you want to look at it that way, they're right. It's true. They were doing better than the North, um, financially speaking. Uh, basing their economy off of cotton. So we have, um, due to Whitney's cotton gin, we've talked about that. There's this increasing reliance on slave labor. Whoops. Um, and that increasing reliance, here, here's the crazy part, right? So what's going to happen is before Whitney's cotton gin, People were starting to let go of the idea of slavery. They were starting to recognize the inherent hypocrisy in, in yay, 4th of July independence, and, oh yeah, I, I own actual people. Whether or not they actually believed that African Americans were equal to them, they, they were beginning to let go of the idea of owning another person. Well then, with the cotton gin, it led to the expansion of cotton production, and it led to an increasing need and an increasing reliance on slave labor. And so a lot of slave owners will actually grow very adamant in their um, need for slaves They're, because of the economic need. Um, and so to rectify that hypocrisy that they feel, they will... That's why they build their social structure on this idea of racial superiority. They will bring scientists in to try and back up their ideas of um, how different races are inferior based on biology. Um, yeah. So cotton will supplant the um, traditional crops of the South, rice, sugar, tobacco. Those will all pretty not completely go away. But they won't be number one anymore. Um, and here's the thing. Northern shippers, they will profit off of this. They will profit off of uh, cotton production. Because guess what they're trying to do? They are trying to um, create textile industries. And the South is so much closer. And technically it's the United States. So there's no, there's no tariff on the cotton for them, only for the foreign markets, right? They're, they they don't um they get to pay bottom do, like bottom dollar basement dollar on the cotton, whereas so the cotton production the cotton producers are like you know what we're selling this for you for really cheap and we can get a better price in in Europe but you're preventing us from getting sales in Europe with your tariffs and your trade issues and your banking issues, so. <clears throat> So at this time, the South produces um, half of the world's cotton. Wow, missing an, an apostrophe there. Go grammar. Don't let me say find out. Um, and they really did become a one-crop economy. And remember, I, I said earlier that an agricultural economy is dangerous just in general, but it is especially dangerous when you put all of your eggs in one basket or all of your crops in one basket or whatever, however you want to look at it. And cotton is also really difficult. It's hard on the land. Um, and so it requires an expansion. So what's wrong with a one crop economy? So the British is tied to the South. So they have a vested interest in seeing the South um, separate, really. I mean, if you think about it, and we're talking about the British, we know that they're shady. We know they're, they're going to try and do whatever they can to get the best deal for themselves, and they are still an imperial power. They do still have colonies. 
So they would probably love to take the South back into their fold. Um, at any moment, a one-crop economy could lead to possible economic collapse. Um, there was a lack of manufacturing. But we talked about this. Um, so the, the planter aristocracy, remember I said that 1%, it was 1,733 families out of the entire South. From Virginia to Texas, the whole thing. Well, well not Texas at this point, but... Um, they will basically lead the South. Everything will be around their whim, and, and people lesser than them will not really have a stay. Uh, they have a lot of time for leisure, for study, for um, engaging in the government, which is going to further widen the gap between rich and poor. They had very few. They had very few public schools in the South because the wealthy used tutors or European boarding schools. Because remember, I called it the new feudalism because they really did kind of ascribe to this European, this old world European um, ideology, I guess. Um, and they saw public schools as pauper schools. That's where the po people. No, no, we're not po. We send our 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 people elsewhere. Um, if you want to look at how life was romanticized, how that myth was created, Sir Walter Scott is probably um, the best example. That's what he did, is he romanticized it. He was an author. Uh, Mark Twain is going to make fun of him all the time. He thinks very poorly of him. So, cotton growing, it spoiled the land, so they had to continue to push further and further west, and you know what that means. Not just small farmers being pushed off their lands, but also Native Americans will continuously be pushed further and further west um, into a reservation system. Um, and remember, at any moment, things could go wrong. They overextended their credit. Um, and, you know, when you overextend credit, you're over-speculating. And what do I say? Every panic has, ca has been caused by speculation. So this overextension of credit will lead to over over speculation of land and crops and cotton and eventually what do you think is coming all right so the cost of running a plantation is it's very expensive um especially because the south is going to depend on the north for shipping and they need that shipping to get their cotton from the south to europe where they're dependent upon foreign markets all right so there wasn't much immigration to the South because, well, how do you compete with um, ownership of another person? How do you do that? Especially if you've got, if you're talking about people who are, who treat, legitimately treat slaves like less than dogs, right? They beat them. If you're an immigrant, you're like, mm, let's see, I could try and compete with slave labor and get paid practically nothing. Um, or I could move to the north and get paid a little more and, you know, accept being a wage slave. They couldn't buy land. The, the land was too expensive because of that overextension of credit. Because of that um, overspeculation, it actually led to a um, inflation of land prices. And, well, quite frankly, they were ignorant of cotton growing. They're coming from a different, like, they're... We're talking about the Irish. We're talking about the German. Cotton is not grown. <laughs> the climate, the um, soil is not correct for cotton growing. So they really have no knowledge of cotton growing. So they go places where they're a little more familiar with what's going on. All right. Okay, so now let's talk about the peculiar institution of slavery. Um, here we have another rendition, Hauling the Whole Week's Pickings, um, by William Henry Brown in 1842. Um, notice what's actually happening. Notice the color of the slaves. Notice, um, it, yeah, it doesn't look like easy work. It wasn't easy work. Cotton picking is not easy work. Um, plantation slavery was... Uh, at its best, forced labor. At its worst, horrible, horrible condition. If you were a slave, you lived a life of ignorance, hard work, oppression. You you were prevented from really bettering yourself. You were preventing 
prevented from educating yourself. It was illegal to receive an education. Um, you, because it was an agricultural society, you were forced to work from dawn until dusk. You always had um, someone overseeing you, either a white overseer or a black driver. And often the black driver was worse than the white overseer because, again, it's, it's that idea of superiority because that was a position of power in for people who had traditionally not had any. So if you became a driver, then you were seen as better than. Um, you had no civil or political rights. You were not seen as a person. You were not treated as a person. So it, it was um, a hard life. So this is a picture of a man who has been flogged. Um, Whippings were common. If you acted out in any way, you you actually were seen to deserve the punishment that you received. Even if your back does end up looking like this, this, this is atrocious. This is an, an atrocity. And in no way can you ever defend something like this. Um, and really, your master and any of their subordinates, whether they were white or black, if they did this to you, um, if you were a slave, you really couldn't do anything. There was nothing that you could do to um, get back at them. You couldn't sue them. You had no legal rights. You couldn't vote to prevent this from happening again. Um, uh, some states, hey, no child under the age of 10 was sold. Now, if you think about this, at this point, Slavery, the slave trade itself is illegal. So like that uh, triangular trade, that's illegal. You cannot buy slaves from Africa or from the West Indies or from the Caribbean. You So what ended up happening is they would actually um, impregnate female slaves. Female slaves were highly regarded because they could produce more slaves. It was like a loophole around the banning of the slave trade they um slaves could not get married in fact most of them were seen um as uncapable of or incapable of creating that deep connection for marriage um flogging was was common but it it was not used excessively because if look at this guy's back if you do that he's he's no longer you like he can't work for a long period of time and to help him survive, you actually have to pay for medical services. So it was only used in extreme conditions or extreme circumstances. But my argument is that under no circumstance is that, um, should that be a usual punishment for any crime, whatever it is. Um, despite the fact that slaves could not get married. They created a stable family life. That's why the family becomes core to the culture of the slave. They, um, they believed in two-parent families. They, they didn't marry first cousins. They adhered to that same idea that um, Americans believed in because first cousins lead to, you know, bad things. Um, and I, I've talked about this before, but they do com they actually created a um, cultural religion by combining Christian and African elements. Um, you get a lot of Haitian in there. That's why you have um, African Black Creole, right? You have um, Gullah. You have uh, various rites and religions that are that occur within the culture of the African American. Um, sector of society. Um, yeah, so it becomes part of who they are. Let's look at slave auctions. Slave auctions, um, they were treated, they still existed. Remember, they banned it in D.C. Like, you couldn't have slave auctions in the capital of the nation because, well, that just looks bad. But, hey, they were, they were all over the place. They were happening all the time in the South. And, um, 
they would line them up on, on a stage, basically, and people would go up to them and they would check their teeth and check their muscle tone. And, and based on all of that, based on their age and based on their experience and based on what they looked like and, and their perceived strength, they garnered more money. The slave, like the price of the slave went up. Um, and slaves were pretty expensive. They, because we're talking about a lifelong investment. Um, they weren't anywhere near the price of paying for, um, paying wage labor. They weren't anywhere near the cost of free labor, but they were, and they were considered an investment because they were property. You cannot forget that, that slaves were not seen as people. Yeah. They just weren't. Um, here's a rendition of a slave auction. You can see what I was talking about. Uh, people um, milling around, getting the best price. Notice the black guy on the horse, most likely, and he's got a whip in his hand. He was considered a black driver. Um, so he was probably purchasing for the master. Um, they were probably the ugliest part. Slave auctions were probably the ugliest part of the institution. Um, they were put up next to cows, to other chattel, to um, livestock. They broke up families. Families were torn apart. They were um, sent off. So even though they couldn't sell um, slave children under the age of 10, they could sell the child's mother, they could sell the child's father, and they just, they had to some way, white owners had to some way um, make this action okay. Because if you thought of these slaves as people, then all of a sudden you have to realize that you have destroyed families, you have destroyed lives, you have done atrocious, horrible things. And that's something that many can't reconcile. Um, Here's an anti-slave pamphlet. Uh, slave branding was a huge thing. Abolitionism really becomes big in this time period because of all of this that's coming out of the South, of what people in the North and the South and the West are seeing. And it's, it's, it doesn't jive with Christian values. Now remember, we're coming off of the Second Great Awakening. We're coming off of this idea of transcendentalism, this idea of, of individualism and, and connecting with God. And, and then you look at this, how do, you, how do you reconcile that? You can't. You cannot reconcile that. Some slave accoutrement. Um, you've got various brands right here. Uh, you have a slave muzzle. Muzzles were common um, to prevent people from screaming. Again, these are things that, like, muzzles are still used on animals. They treated them like animals. You have collars. You have leg irons. You have tags. Look at these shoes. They're cracked. They're broken. They're barely together. They probably didn't fit whoever was wearing them. It was bad. So, remember I was talking about slave-owning families by 1850? Um, you see how much of the population had what? And really, the that, set, that 1,733 families, those are the ones that really controlled everything in the South. Um, so we have laws that backed up slavery. In the U.S. Constitution, you have it written into our foundational document that slaves are less than. Um, you have a fugitive slave clause that the South uh, forced into the Constitution, basically, that said that um, fugitive slaves are to be returned to their masters. And of course, with the Constitution, this is, this is a Constitution is a guideline. It's a series of guidelines. Um, and so it's up to the legislative branch to then write that into law, which they did in 1793 by creating the Fugitive Slave Act, which basically stated that, you know, slaves had to be returned to their masters um, and if you didn't and you were discovered that you did not return slaves, then you had to pay a fine. By 1850, however, the Fugitive Slave Act was redone, resubmitted. It was made stronger. Um, there was not just legal action, but actual jail time associated with this. And in that period from 1793 to 1850, the Underground Railroad will become much larger because guess what? 
when somebody is held in bondage against their will, um, rebellion occurs. And there will be quite a few slave rebellions. So you have to think about slavery from the perspective, not just of the slave owners. You can't just look at it as an economic way of life. You can't just look at it as feudalism. Oh, that's how it was. You have to look at it that we actually validated the ownership of other people. And this will cause some serious divides within our country. And you can't forget that. Okay, so I think that's everything. It's like all said and done, a very long lecture. And I'm sorry about that, but there's a lot of really good information. Um, you can get a lot more information, a lot more details from reading. Um, I would definitely do that before the reading check on Tuesday. I look forward to seeing your answers. Bye-bye for now. Talk to you later. Bye.